why smart people struggle. Hi, friends. Welcome to Someone Gets Me. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the reasons that smart people struggle in this world. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. I have six things I'm going to highlight, and there's more and there's nuance to all of it. But I really want us to think about the struggles in our lives sometimes and the things that are happening within communication and relationships that may have to do with a mismatch in processing or intelligence or the way we see the world in addition to autobiography and circumstance. So these are some ideas to ponder. I am not saying they apply to everybody, but what I am saying is let's all pay attention a little deeper to some of these things. We live in a world that is full of chaos sometimes, and there's peace in the middle of the storm, and we're intense and sensitive, and some people relate to us differently, and we relate to others differently, and there's no wrong answer. So these are just ideas to ponder and things that I notice in my work as an intuitive mentor for gifted people and as being a counselor and therapist and all these for many, many years. And I also experience these in my own life. So I'm going to tell you some stories along the way. There's six things that kind of popped in right away when I decided that this was the topic to talk about. Now, this topic was requested by a smart person who was trying to understand how come smart people struggle. And so here you go. Number one, overthinking. I call it analysis paralysis. Smart people tend to try to figure everything out. Well, that's because we're highly rewarded for it when we're younger. Can you do um, the scientific method and can you figure things out and use your mind? My family always told me when I was little, if you can give me a rational explanation and explain why you need or want a toy or whatever it is, if you can logic your way and convince me, you can have it. I became very good at that. And people even said when I was in high school and college that I should go into law because I can argue things or see things from different ways. In fact, being a counselor and being an attorney or counselor at law in the dictionary of occupational titles are very, very close. So I learned that skill. But the dark side of overthinking is analysis paralysis, where we think and figure so much that we figure ourselves into a hole or a darkness or a corner. And so what happens is we don't do anything. We can't move out of where we are because we're so overthinking. I've had several gifted clients I've worked with over the years that are making their lives very difficult because they refuse to use anything other than their brain to live life. Now, we are not only our thinking. We're not only our emotions. We're not only our soul or our gut. We are all of those things housed in a really cool body. So we have all of these dimensions of us that are designed to interact and play together. So when we're highly reinforced for thinking, 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 figuring, thinking, figuring, thinking, we cheapen our life experience over time. Now, I also have some people I've worked with and some people I know in professions and industries where their high cognitive thinking, figuring ability is highly rewarded and it's highly needed in our society. And at times, they struggle with relationships sometimes and they struggle with other things that maybe I'm going to mention here because it's, it's a little bit out of balance. So realize that if you're trying to figure everything out, not every answer is in the figuring. Yeah, sometimes I say when somebody says, I got to figure it out, I'll say, well, what if that's not where the answer is? Now, what are you going to do? Sometimes it's there, but not always. The second way that smart people struggle is (laughs) distraction and rabbit holes. (laughs) You know, like, and I do it and I I have just about everybody I know who has a smart brain does it. We get into a topic or a subject and we dive so deep that sometimes time has no relevance and we want to learn everything we can possibly learn about it. Everything we can possibly learn about it. And it's not wrong. And it may not always serve us. We don't have to know everything about everything. My mother was a gifted person and she used to tell me when I was very young, I never knew what it meant. But she always would say, honey, you don't have to know everything. You have to know who and where to go to get the information. Now, back then there were encyclopedias because we didn't have Google and 
Back then, she was teaching me how to appreciate the gifts of other people by saying that. I didn't totally understand I was in first or second grade when she said that. But what I do know is that it's really easy as a smart person to get drawn into rabbit holes and lose ourselves. And again, it's not a a good or bad thing. It's more about, is it working for us? Is it serving us? Sometimes diving down the rabbit holes and educating ourselves on something pays off. Sometimes it's unnecessary and distracts us from our emotion or our spirit or what our physical needs are. You know, I've had clients who have gone into these deep searches and, and learnings and the neat all day. That's cattywampus. That doesn't work. Got to fuel your, your body with the right nutrients, right? Or get so distracted into rabbit holes that emotionally dysregulate somebody because they get upset or they beat themselves up. I mean, you, you heard my episode about my beloved Maggie um, leaving Earth. And I look back sometimes on some of the guidance I was given that didn't go with some of the research I had. And when I questioned it, I got pushback. So we can do our research. We can go down the rabbit holes. We can learn things because we want to be educated consumers and educated humans. And there is still the spirit and the emotion and the physical body that goes with it. So pay attention. Are you being distracted and going down rabbit holes because you're smart and you can And it's to the liability or maybe even just the ignoring of something more important like food, like emotional well-being, like physical exercise, right? Those things are important. You are an entire being, not just a brain. I have a client who I, in fact, said to him, you know, you're not a brain on a stick. And he looked at me like I spoke Chinese, like what? And he actually got mad at me because he was so reinforced in the technology industry for his brain that he missed the fact that take care of your body, take care of your soul, take care of your emotions. He thought he was taking care of his body because he, he was checking off the list of what you need to do, drink this much water, do this, do this, but it was still all in his head. Never loved the rest of him. The second thing uh, that smart people do that, they, that makes them struggle more in the world is what I call time optimism. Meaning, If I need to be somewhere in 15 minutes and it takes me 14 minutes to get there, I leave in 14 and a half minutes. And then if something happens, I'm all dysregulated because, oh, there was a traffic jam or hit the wrong red light or this or that. Or the other way around, being so early that it feels like everybody else is late. So a lot of smart people, linear time kind of escapes them. And and I'll use that humor line. I'll say, I don't do linear time well. So... I can't tell you how long something's been going on sometimes or I unless I have a marker because I'm too much in the flow. And I notice that the more I meditate and the more I'm in the moment and in the flow, the more this can sometimes be an issue. A time optimism also happens when it comes to completing work, homework in school, projects at work and work around your home, like any kind of work or project or thing to do, because we can look at it and I can say, well, I can do this eight-hour task in four hours, and so I'll just wait four hours and then do it. (laughs) And then if anything goes wrong, like the computer crashes or internet goes down or whatever the situation is, now we're late, and now we've added pressure to ourselves. Conversely, and also with that, as I have a client that I'm working with, and, and this person's really amazing and get things done very fast, there's a lot of writing and and nuance involved in this person's profession. And what we've noticed over time is that this person is really good at getting things done quickly. So what has happened? Her employer has started giving more and more and more to the point of almost burning out. Because if you can do a project, an eight-hour project in four hours, then you can do two eight-hour projects in eight hours, right? So it's all about understanding time. It's linear relevance. And then how to nurture and take care of yourself along the way. So if you have unresolved issues, thankfully this person didn't, but if you have those unresolved issues of I have to prove myself, I have to do better and better and better, and I'm a machine and I can can do it, then we end up burning ourselves out. In a lot of careers, smart people 
burn themselves out in a couple of years because they believe they're like machines. We're trained to do that. And just because you're smart and you can solve problems quickly or get projects done quickly, or you're smart and you don't have any any reference to time at all. And so it's like, sometimes it's like, oh, you mean I'm late? Oh, you mean I have to go there? All of these things. We want to remember that time is a linear two-dimensional construct, right? We're moving forward in two-dimensional co- and construct. So it matters that we really pay attention to this, that we pay attention to time and our relationship to time in every different direction. And some smart people, we struggle with that at times. I do that. I'll do it where I'm like, well, it's not due for three days and I'll just do it right before it's due. Like, why do it early? Well, that's not always the best plan because I'm doing everything at the last minute, right? And also, sometimes we can do things faster or sometimes because of our processing speed, we do things a little slower. We want to make friends with how our own being, our mind, our emotions, our spirit, our physical self engages with time and the idea of time rather than just thinking, well, I'm smart. I can handle it. It's that's not the most effective thing. The fourth thing is social awkwardness. That smart people hurt a lot in social situations. A lot of smart people have a, um, very interesting senses of humor and our one-liners might just escape other people or they figure it out three days later and then we feel misunderstood. Or we're not really sure how to communicate emotions or boundaries and all of these things around social interaction situations. Because if you spend a lot of your life being misunderstood or not understood or always in a different like wavelength then sometimes it can create awkwardness in a situation. And sometimes because you're smart or somebody might know you're smart or you might say something, they might assume you know everything there is to know and kind of exclude you because you know that already. Or you're smart, you can figure it out. When maybe we want to be the student, maybe we want to learn. So social awkwardness can come in lots of forms, but the most common one I see a lot is processing speeds, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but also with the sense of humor and language set. When I very first started this podcast, my first editors were like, wow, we have to learn different words. You and your people use words differently than others. To me, it was totally normal. So sometimes I have to slow down a little bit and make sure that the the listener understands the definition of the word I'm using, not because they're stupid, but because sometimes I use words differently than others. And that's no, again, no right or wrong. It just happens that way. Social awkwardness can also come from our overexcitabilities and our spiritual intensities. Because people like me who are empaths and really connected, we can feel people and their and what's going on way before they open their mouth or even get too close to us. I was in an event yesterday where I was the beginner and Um, A couple people who are like kind of physically taller than me because I'm quite short just were talking over me like the conversation was going over my head like this. And I was trying to be part of the conversation and introduce myself to the person and doing all the socially appropriate things. And it was doing this and you could I could feel it. And then a little while later, because I was with my my friend who was taller than me. So they were they were the one bantering. And so later on, we were on the same conversation, but in a different place of this event. And that woman who the other woman who didn't hear me introduce myself, didn't hear my name, didn't pay any attention at all because it was going over my head, physically going over my head because I'm short. And then looked at me and said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name when it was used many times. So it creates awkwardness because I could tell that's what was happening way back earlier in the interaction. And, and it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel very welcoming for a new person in your life to just talk right over you, literally over my language, as if I wasn't there. And then when my friend who who's so sweet said something about me, like drew attention to me and what my um, skill set was with the topic, then the person asked my name. So there's all kinds of situations. And that just comes because I've had experience being short in a tall world, and it has backfired multiple of times. I can't help my height. 
all I can do is have a presence and a permission and a little bit of forgiveness and compassion for the people who aren't paying attention, right? So there's all kinds of situations and parts of our autobiography that go with this. So it's not a right or wrong. It's about being aware. And so social awkwardness is a big thing. Introverts, empaths, smart people, some of us do the world in a different wavelength than others. Historically, that event would have had me shut down and I would have either gone into a corner, I was with my friend, so I couldn't leave, or I would have left historically, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yesterday, when it happened, all I did was go, huh, that's interesting. Look, huh, they're missing. This other person's missing me and who I am. And I could be a big supporter of them. And uh, there you have it. So in my own growth and my own awareness of my value and my worth, that I can still struggle in social situations and I don't let it in personally as um, an affront or something is wrong with me. So we want to really look at that and, and, and heal our, ourselves, that part of us that doesn't think we're worthy because we're all taught that. We're taught that we're um, not worthy because we're human. That's not true. So the next thing is processing speeds. Processing speeds are really big because smart people process differently than neurotypical or, or people that aren't as smart in, on, a, on an intellectual level because you might be smart in other ways, right? Because we have the people who are the thinkers, who ponder things. I had a family I worked with some time ago and um, actually a couple of them where different members of the family were more the pondering processing speed. So I would throw out ideas or I would ask questions. We would have a dialogue. And then the next time I would see them a week or two weeks later, or even a month later, the thinker people in the family would come back with information from their deep dives, understanding, putting things together, asking intelligent questions about the information that I presented or that we were talking about after they had a chance to think about it and ponder it and apply it. So to expect somebody who processes that way to immediately know the answer and jump through the hoops does everybody a disservice. So once I learn that somebody's a, a processor and a thinker and a ponderer and they put things together, then I know that my role often is just ask questions and give information and point to things and give them a chance to process it in their executive functioning and put it together in a way that works for them. And every, in every single event, the person who's the thinker always comes back with, you know, I was thinking about what you said, or I was thinking about X, Y, Z, whatever it was. And then they have more to say about it. So had I expected them because they're smart to do it right away, that would have created a big rift and a big misunderstanding because everybody processes differently. Now, I also have people that I've worked with and, and I'm kind of in this, I'm kind of balanced a little bit, I think, in these, um, that thinks so fast in rapid fire that I know that in, in, a, you know, in any interaction, we're going to cover three times the ground I will with a lot of other people because they're always going and they go very fast. And so the, the work for this person is to integrate, to give themselves permission to slow down and breathe for a minute every once in a while and integrate all this information. I have a client who reads four and five and six books a week and then also listens to audiobooks and writes stuff down and take handouts and take courses about whatever topic, that deep diving part of having to learn everything there is to learn in a rabbit hole. But if you don't take the time to integrate it, to slow down and say, okay, how does all this myriad of information, all of this stuff I've collected, how does it apply to me? How does it land on me physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? How does it apply? How does it even matter? And so the rapid fire thinkers are really good at going really fast. And so their work often is slow down every once in a while and integrate it. I have several people I've worked with over the time where they're hungry for more personal development and more work and learn, 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 grow, work, learn, grow. And every once in a while, I'll say, so what are you doing to integrate it? What are you doing? to take all this stuff you're doing, all these things you're learning and see how they apply to you and integrating it into your experience of life. 
just knowing a lot of things or reading a lot of books or expecting ourselves to be like a, like a computer, just plug it in and now it's there. That's not how we roll. Our being needs time to integrate physically, emotionally, spiritually. There's a phrase called chemicalization. It's a word, actually. And that word chemicalization comes out of the metaphysical new thought movement from like the late 1800s, where it talks about the physical changes that our body goes through as we grow and expand our consciousness with the idea that our bodies are very dense, right? And so sometimes when we learn something that's really like an aha or an epiphany, that's really light and like, whoa, right? Our body, our physical cells, our muscles, our organs, it takes a little bit for them to catch up to that. Wow. So sometimes it can be like nausea or headaches or just tiredness as the physical body catches up with all the amazing spiritual and emotional and mental ahas. And so there's a word for it, chemicalization. And I have felt it many times in my life where major growth, major change, major awareness, and then it's like, whoa. Oh, and then the body has to catch up. So there's all kinds of experiences of how we integrate things. And fast thinking people really want to learn the idea that we need to integrate and slow down and really go within enough to let all of us, the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual part of us grow together. And so it's always a balancing act. Somebody's leading the show and the other people are Picking up the rear, but we want to bring it all together, not just our head on a stick. We started out there, right? Now, this last one I want to cover is probably the one of the most important ones, and that is not being heard. A lot of times, smart people struggle because we're not heard. Whether it's we use different words than other people, or what I've heard multiple times in my life is, Well, you're smart. You should have known that already. All smart people don't know everything in the whole world. We don't. Yet, I've heard it related to my websites. I've heard it related to this very podcast with previous people who were helping me with it in the very beginning. I've heard it relating to my physical health and my mental health. I've heard it related to my dog. I have heard it related to just about everything in my life. Well, you're smart. You should have known. I had a really great trainer um, that I would meet at the gym, you know, four times a week at five in the morning. And we did all these things. And and I remember I was working out one day with him. This was years ago. And and I really loved him. And I still do. He's amazing. And, And I said, well, how come you didn't tell me? I don't even remember what the topic was, but how come you didn't tell me this? He goes, well, you're smart. You should have known that already. What? Just because somebody's smart doesn't mean they know everything. And so at one point in my life, I kind of called it the halo effect. Like, okay, so we're smart. So we should know everything there is to know in the whole world always. No, smart people know that we know just a fraction. And so, and sometimes the smarter we are, the harder life is. So not being heard is, is a big deal. And being heard and being loved are the two like primary human needs. So when we walk around not being heard or being dismissed because we're asking a question or the person's missing us, then knowingly or unknowingly, it's not about motive. It's just about think about this for a minute. I asked a question in a podcast interview. This has happened numerous times. I'll ask a specific question and the person will say something albeit really useful, had nothing to do with the question. So what do you do in an interview? Go back and ask the question again or keep on going, right? In some cases, I've done both. But just because, I mean, I I remember I used to say this too. I used to say, all right, it comes out of my mouth and out of my head in English with really good grammar. And then when it lands on the other person, it's in Greek or Chinese or some other language because what they're saying back doesn't go with what I said. That's not being heard whether it's because that other person is distracted or has fear or doesn't understand the language set or whatever, the truth is, in that moment, I wasn't heard. And when we're not heard, we struggle. I ask specific questions about things and I get answers unrelated to the question. So I always try to 
make sure that what I'm listening to, that I'm hearing the person. And if I don't understand what they're saying, or I'm not even 100% sure, I inquire. I was having a conversation recently with somebody that I know, and, and I was using terms. And then finally, I had that intuition that said, ask if this person even understands what you're saying. Because they didn't ask me any questions. They said nothing. They said they heard me and they got it and we were dialoguing. But I had that intuition that they didn't understand what I was talking about. So I said, do you even know what this is? And they said, no. So the truth was I wasn't being heard. But the other person wasn't willing to say, hold on a second. I don't understand you. I don't understand what you're talking about. What, what are you talking about? So we can be not heard because the other person doesn't inquire or because we assume the person knows. And so I always do this little experiment when I, when I run groups, I'll say, okay, so everybody draw a red stove and then they would draw them and no two people drew the same red stove. So we can use the same words and have different meaning, different intention, different power. So it really matters if we're going to have connection. And this goes back to the social awkwardness that we listen and hear with our ears and our heart. And we ask questions when we're confused or we don't know. And then we also pay attention to the listener, whether it's a group or a single person, to ensure that what we're saying or doing in our, all of our mannerisms, because communication is much more than words, that it all goes together. It, very smart people, we can get serious. And I've had people before say, why are you so angry? And I'm like, actually, I was happy. I was just thinking. And then I would chuckle and say, if, if I'm angry, you will know it because I can express my feelings. But a serious look on someone's face does not necessarily equate to anger. So communication and being heard as a primary human experience that we really need to have to be healthy is one of the number one ways smart people struggle. They can miss, you can mistake anger for, um, you know, somebody being angry when they're really just thinking. You know, I have some other people that I know and work with where they want to be emotionally connected, but they're not really sure how because they've been reinforced for their brain all the time and they're practicing boundaries and they're practicing using their intuition. Or maybe they work in an industry that doesn't appreciate emotions and, and connection and relationship, like to relate to others, right? Then there's all the different levels of intimacy. There's eight levels to intimacy. And, and um, sexuality is like at the bottom of the, is number seven or eight on that list. And so what about all the others, like aesthetics, like in intellect, like entertainment, right? There's way more to connection and intimacy. It means into me, see. What about somebody who's an intuitive but works in a field that doesn't admit that people are intuitive, but yet they use their intuition, like in different kinds of technology and science particularly, right? Or those people tend to be intuitive to figure it out, but you don't admit to it. So see, there's lots of nuance to how come smart people struggle. Because oftentimes the world, the collective, is operating at a, a different pace, a different way than that person who's might be smart and struggling. And so even two smart people can struggle within a relationship because there's a mismatch often. So I think that the solution, I think, for all of us is to slow down for a minute, which is a little tricky because we live in a fast-paced world, and pay attention on a deeper level to who and what is going on, not only within us, but also within the other person. There have been times when I've been going through things and somebody would want advice or whatever. And I'd say, you know, I really want to listen to you. And I can hear you as a friend. And I don't have a whole lot of emotional, I call it bandwidth. I don't have a lot of bandwidth for these extra things. Now, we can either not talk or we can, but I just want to tell you that that's kind of where I am right now today. And so same thing with visionary people, like we're really creative and we're visionary, but that doesn't mean that it's on all the time, you know? So. How do we moderate it? Well, I suggest that one of the ways we moderate and make friends with being a smart person in a world that's not, that's not always conducive and create struggle 
is to dance with the struggle rather than push back on it. So many times people try to push on the struggle. And what I always say is whatever you push on grows, it has to push back at you. So what if we danced or what if we surfed or what if we realized that, okay, this struggle I'm feeling or I'm experiencing either within me or in the world, what if I danced with it instead of pushed on it? What if I looked at a way to use the energy of the struggle in my favor? What if I took that angst, that stuff, and used it in my favor? What if I changed the inner dialogue? What if I changed the questions? What if I changed the way I approached it? Rather than walking around going, oh, this world doesn't get me, blah, 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 and going on and on and on and making it very hard on myself. What if I said, well, this is really interesting. Like when the people were talking over my head, I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. Historically, that would have really hurt my feelings or upset me or shut me down or whatever. And today, I'm just kind of watching this going, wow, okay, well, I guess I don't really need to put a lot of energy into this situation, at least not yet. And so it gave me freedom to dance with that versus letting it into my being and creating this awkward, you know, kind of staticky feeling. So we always have a choice. We always have our own authority. We always have our own integrity with how we're going to approach the world. And most of the time, if not all the time, our struggles come because what we expect out of the world is not what the world is giving to us. That we have a different view, a different agenda, a different expectation that then creates the resentment. And resentment means to re-feel something that creates that, and then we struggle. So one of the ways to help ourselves struggle less is to realize, first of all, not all struggle is bad. And second of all, that if a struggle is serving us, like lifting weights in the gym, right? That can have value. Sometimes a hard conversation with struggle can have value. So to really pay attention to this, to whatever we're perceiving as a struggle and seeing how, ask yourself this, how can I use this in my favor? How can I take what's happening here and use it in my favor? And you'll see, because your brain has to answer every question you ask it. So when you ask that question, your brain will tell you, your heart and soul, it'll all tell you, this is how you use this in your favor. This is how you do this. And then the road opens for you. And then those of you who are thinkers and ponderers, all that information comes together and it emerges as this thing of beauty, the awareness, the aha, the change, the confirmation, the verification. Those of you who are moving really fast, When you say, how can I use all of this in my favor? And you slow down and ask the question and you become aligned in your integrity, mind, body, and soul. That level of alignment, you allow your emotions and your heart and your gut to have a voice. Your entire world changes for the better. It's really amazing. So smart people struggle. Because sometimes we're on a different wavelength and a different plane, even from other smart people. And we expect that everyone should be the way we are because our brain says that everybody's the same as us when really nobody is. No two people are the same. So when we talk about neurodiversity, I'm like, well, of course, because no two people are the same, not only in our makeup, but also in our autobiography. So when you expect everything to be a certain way, you're going to struggle much more than if you realize that you can be fully engaged in life and be non-attached to the outcome. You can flow and dance and surf and bring all of who you are without attachment, and then you're free. Friends, I hope that this episode of Someone Gets Me has served you in a way that is meaningful. And I want to remind you that you're beautiful, you are lovable, and you are capable. Until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well.